Greetings from Brisbane uh, at the University of Queensland. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to host the first inaugural seminar of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Uh, we are a proud member of the SDSN. I'd like to especially thank Monash University, which is hosting the Australia Pacific hub for the SDSN. Uh, my name is Salim Ali. I'm a professor here at the University of Queensland at the Sustainable Minerals Institute. And this seminar at UQ is co-sponsored by the Sustainable Minerals Institute and the Global Change Institute. Of course, the topic of our discussion is very near and dear to us. The Great Barrier Reef is an iconic biodiversity landmark for the planet. It is often referred to as the pulse of the planet, and it is used as an indicator for environmental sustainability issues from climate change to land degradation and oceanic pollution. So it is befitting that we chose this topic to exemplify how different kinds of environmental conflicts need to be reconciled if we are to achieve the sustainable development goals which were launched in September of last year by the United Nations. The SDSN is a grassroots network which has been set up in parallel by the UN and by the Earth Institute and other partners in order for civil society, universities, to help and contribute towards the SDG mandate. Now, the topic is also befitting currently because this week we have also seen the premiere of David Attenborough's documentary on the Great Barrier Reef. And Sir David has noted that in his travels over many decades, the most enchanting ecosystem that he has encountered is indeed the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, our guest and our uh, seminar presenter, distinguished presenter, is very familiar with the reef. He's one of the world's leading experts on the reef, uh, Professor Ove uh, Her Guldberg, who has uh, worked with Sir David and has been a scientist uh, studying the reef for the past few decades. Uh, he has also been very engaged in policy making globally around the reef. He's very familiar with the UNESCO World Heritage listing process, which has been another anchor for our discussion today. The UNESCO World Heritage System uh, has been a very important soft power mechanism by which environmental conservation as well as archaeological conservation can be pushed in the international arena. And in that context, he has also been awarded uh, the Prince of Monaco Prize for Ocean Conservation. He's the Deputy Director of the Australian Research Council's Centre for Excellence in Coral Reef Systems. And he is also, of course, the Director of UQ's Global Change Institute. He is also very familiar, I should note, with the process by which the Australian government responded to this concern that was raised by UNESCO. UNESCO has taken the uh, listing of endangered sites very seriously, and there are now 48 sites currently on the UNESCO endangered list. I should note this is different from a delisting. There was, uh, at one point in some of the announcements, a note on delisting of uh, World Heritage Sites, uh, the Great Barrier Reef was never in threat of delisting. It was only in threat of being categorized as in danger. Uh, and that in itself is, of course, quite concerning. Uh, there are sites globally which also Professor uh, Ove Herg Goldberg is familiar with, uh, such as the Everglades in Florida, which have been endangered listed, as well as the reefs in Belize and the Caribbean. So this is something that is definitely taken seriously by UNESCO and the decisions are made. Uh, and in fact, the decision to not list the, the reef as in danger is significant in that context. So our discussion will try to understand how this process unfolded as an example of an environmental conflict which was tentatively resolved through good science and through good policy making. Now, of course, there, there is still another story which remains to be told in this context, uh, and this is an ongoing process. 
So we're not by any means going to be complacent about the issue, but we do hope that the webinar will be taken in that spirit globally by the audience uh, as a means of collective learning so that your kinds of environmental conflicts that you might be dealing with can consider the role of soft power, the role of science, uh, and effective policy advocacy uh, in order to try and get a better outcome in meeting the sustainable development goals. So without further ado, then, I will hand it over to Professor Ove Herr Goldberg to continue with the webinar, and we will, of course, take your questions in about half an hour's time. There is going to be a series of mechanisms by which you can uh, ask the questions by logging on to live stream. You can also send an email. Uh, we already put the details there, and uh, we look forward to a very <coughs> vibrant discussion. Thank you so much, and over to Ov. Well, thank you very much, Professor Ali. Um, one of the modern dilemmas uh, that societies are facing is the perceived trade-off between so-called natural values and those associated with the extraction of commodities that are often associated then with jobs and opportunity. And given the finite nature of our planet, it's clear that we have to have both in order to have a healthy, prosperous and successful society. And that is, you can't really destroy the natural world around us, yet you've got to have jobs and opportunities for, for people. And of course, in terms of those SDGs, that's going to be one of those challenges, is how do you get the best out of everything? And so if we really are serious about achieving the sustainable development agenda of the United Nations, we really must develop better answers and strategies when it comes to navigating sustainability and, and development. Now, in today's webinar, uh, we really want to discuss this issue and, as um, Salim has said, uh, discuss it in the context of the Great Barrier Reef, which um, is really one of the most spectacular ecosystems on the planet. So I'm planning to speak for about 30 minutes, uh, at which point Salim and I will open the forum for questions and discussion. And hopefully there'll be ample time for us to explore this important and interesting issue. Well, uh, here's what I want to talk about. Um, in my initial remarks, I want to really introduce the Great Barrier Reef, even though I think most people know about it. It's really nice to review the sorts of statistics that go uh, around it, because it is sort of really one of the most incredible places on the planet. And as part of that, I want to lay a bit of the history in terms of uh, the background in terms of history, the ecology, the economic value and vulnerability. And that'll set me up for a discussion of the situation which triggered recent national and international interest and concern over the health and viability of the Great Barrier Reef. And after that, um, I want to then look at the UNESCO process, uh, why it was successful, and I believe it was, uh, and if the best interests of Australia and the world were served. And at this point, as I say, I hope we'll have some vigorous and robust debate, because uh, I think this really is one of the fundamental challenges associated with the SDGs. Well, the Great Barrier Reef, um, when you look at it from space, is this beautiful emerald braid down the Queensland coastline. Uh, there are very few people on the planet, I think, who have, um, have, um, not, heard of, that have not heard about the uh, Great Barrier Reef. It's visible. It's 2,000 kilometres down the coast here, and we can see a, a satellite photograph, and it's this impressive series of habitats. Um, and in terms of prehistory, the Great Barrier Reef has waxed and waned between appearing during the warm periods that we're in right now and disappearing largely during the ice ages. And this is over thousands of years and it's this sort of oscillating climate we've had uh, for many millions of years. Now that said, the Great Barrier Reef uh, has been in this current form for over 10,000 years and has been relatively stable over the Holocene, which is when um, human... Uh, developed a high degree of technology. Now the picture on the right hand side, just down here, uh, we've got about 10 species, that's a tiny uh, fraction of the Great Barrier Reef, but it's these extreme levels of biodiversity that are characteristic of reefs uh, within the Great Barrier Reef. And biologists estimate there may be as many as a million species uh, that live in and around coral reefs, and that you know one in every four fish in the ocean is associated with a coral reef. Now, What's interesting about this is that this is a really small habitat relative to the rest of the world. And when you look at coral reefs, um, they're only less than 0.1% of the total surface of the ocean. So it's really quite stunning. 
Now, um, if you look into the Great Barrier Reef, you can see there's 1,500 species of fish, there's 3,000 species of shellfish, 450 species of corals, and in terms of charismatic megafauna, there are at least 30 species of whales, dolphins, porpoises that have been recorded in and around the Great Barrier Reef, including you know, dwarf minke whales, Indo-Pacific humpback uh, dolphins and humpback whales. And needless to say, the Great Barrier Reef is a paradise for any uh, visitor. Now, its enorm enormity, biodiversity and beauty have and continue to attract attention of people elsewhere. Now, the issue of extractives, this is going in and taking minerals out of the ground and exporting them, um, versus the natural values of the Great Barrier Reef have dogged its history. Um, the first major battles that occurred uh, occurred in the 70s between the conservative Queensland government of Joe Bjelke-Peterson, who wanted to exploit the oil and gas reserves suspected to be underneath the Great Barrier Reef, which was in opposition to the federal Whitlam government of the time, who did not want to see the extraction of minerals such as oil and gas from the Great Barrier Reef. Um, this tussle then led to the Great Barrier Reef Act in 1975, which prohibited uh, the extraction of minerals such as oil and gas within the newly formed Great Barrier Reef Marine Park area. Now, not surprisingly, um, uh, there were also moves at that point to uh, get World Heritage listing of the Great Barrier Reef, and that occurred in uh, 1981. And both of these moves, both at the sort of uh, national level and the international level, were very effective in ensuring the risky, that risky activities such as oil and gas extraction were not allowed to proceed in the Great Barrier Reef region. Uh, if we go back to why the Great Barrier Reef was listed, it was listed on the basis of its exceptional natural beauty and aesthetic importance, as well as being an outstanding example, in quotes, uh, representing significant ongoing ecological and biological processes. And so the Great Barrier Reef sailed through the World Heritage Listing process with um, the listing, as I've just said, in 1981. But of course, listing came with a responsibility to look after the reef, and this is going to be very important, and we'll come back to this. Well, just in terms of, um, you know, in addition to that extraordinary biological diversity that the Great Barrier Reef has, uh, it also represents an enormous source of revenue for Queensland and Australia. Uh, and tourism and fisheries associated with the reef uh, attract over $5 billion each year and provide jobs for 69,000 people. And these industries are largely sustainable and represent opportunities ongoing for Queensland and Australia. And in many ways, the Great Barrier Reef is the gift that keeps on giving. And because these industries are largely sustainable with no net loss uh, over time, they can be considered non-extractive, so there's no net loss over time. Well, at the same time, uh, we do have in Queensland uh, large reserves of, of uh, very valuable commodities. And so in addition to uh, tourism fisheries that make up the Queensland economy, we also have uh, coal and gas and very important exports. And all up, these coal and gas exports represent around $20 billion worth of product per year although in recent years, activities associated with these industries have been declining significantly. But importantly, these extractive industries require coastal infrastructure, which leads to impacts on coastal processes that have a direct impact on the Great Barrier Reef. Now, building coastal infrastructure involves the loss of vegetation, as we see here at uh, Curtis Island uh, in the Great Barrier Reef region, uh, they involve this disruption and loss of the vegetation, coastal processes, and the intervention of human structures such as ports, distillation, and other key industrial facilities. The impact on coastal processes essentially pits extractive industries against non-extractive industries, such as tourism and fisheries associated with the Great Barrier Reef. Now, um, what we're looking at here on Curtis Island are the... Uh, gas liquefaction facilities that were established in 2001 and we're going to come back to this particular example because it's right uh, at the point of a, an important trigger uh, of the um, process that uh, UNESCO uh, then indulged in as far as uh, inspecting how we were treating our World Heritage Listed Great Barrier Reef. Now, um, I should say at 
this point, 2011, there had been growing concern about the condition of the Great Barrier Reef. And this information comes from well-established scientific literature that had been generated principally by the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences, Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, and several large universities along the Queensland coastline. And this scientific information had identified local threats such as declining water quality and pollution, along with overfishing, as being the principal agents of reef decline. And at the same time, increasing temperatures and acidities have also been identified as key longer-term threats. But importantly, these local and global threats um, interact with each other, uh, culminating in accumulative stress, which has important impacts on coral organisms as well as a host of other organisms. Now, as this concern was growing in the early 2000s, uh, the federal government under the leadership of Environment Minister Robert Hill and later David Kemp rezoned the Great Barrier Reef, significantly increasing total protection zones from around 5% to 34%. And at this point, in 2004, uh, both the process and outcome were hailed as great victories for preserving the all-important ecosystems of the Great Barrier Reef. And after all, few other countries had been able to argue at that point for an increase uh, in no-take areas at this scale. Well, up until 2010, after the rezoning uh, and after a, a history of, of protecting the Great Barrier Reef, it appeared that the Queensland and Australian governments could do no wrong when it came to best practice uh, in terms of managing uh, marine parks and sanctuaries. However, this appeared to change around this time. Uh, firstly, there was a build-up of very worrying reports that revealed that the reef had lost 50% uh, of its reef-building corals uh, since the early 1980s. And this was very hardcore evidence provided by the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences from its long-term monitoring sites. And these alarming reports uh, continued uh, to build up and much of the changes were then being attributed to human impacts from deteriorating water quality, declining resilience of corals in response to impacts such as the crown of thorns starfish, climate change and, and disturbances from uh, cyclones and storms. And then there was the sudden appearance uh, on Curtis Island of gas liquefaction facilities which appeared to be within the World Heritage Area, apparently in contravention of the World Heritage Convention, yet authorised by a previous Queensland government. Now this then uh, was enough to spark, so we've got the decline in the ecosystems, we've got what appear to be brazen acts uh, by governments. Uh, this led to uh, a triggering... Um, the UNESCO to, in quote, visit uh, and, and see what was going on. Now, UNESCO's visit uh, to inspect the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage property ignited a political storm. Uh, the more committee members that were visiting learned, the more they began, became concerned about the direction of the Australian and Queensland governments uh, in the directions that they were taking with respect to the reef. And during their first visit, they were greeted by a somewhat defiant state government that was continuing to talk openly about the planned proliferation of port facilities up and down the Queensland coast. And this essentially pitted the extractable mining industries against the non-extractable industries such as tourism and fisheries. And at this point, many actors began to pour into the field of play there were TV ads, we were shown bloated barramundi fish and there were opposing scientific views on whether this was uh, important or not and a very potent mix of politics and intrigue. And on the ground, the politics became divided and balanced science and solutions were lost as the many sides did battle uh, during this debate. Well, the backdrop of a declining reef plus the attitudes of government officials, not surprisingly, triggered a damning report from UNESCO that criticised the management of the Great Barrier Reef, uh, management of the Great Barrier Reef uh, and apparent planned proliferation of port facilities up and down the Queensland coastline. Now, this report specifically recommended that new port development outside uh, the established port areas of Abbott Point um, Gladstone, Hay Point, Mackay and Townsville uh, be really the, sort of the restricted zone. And more importantly, the UNESCO report 
also stated that the real possibility that the GBR property, the Great Barrier Reef uh, World Heritage Area, might be uh, listed as a World Heritage Site in danger. Now, to many people, this outcome would have been a major blow to Australia's reputation as an environmentally responsible nation, uh, with clear ramifications for its uh, iconic tourist industry, which is worth, as I've said before, over five billion US dollars each year. Well, these developments quickly refocus the attention of the Australian public, including key politicians within state and federal governments. And while UNESCO's soft power intervention may have initially raised many antigens, the combination of actors in the landscape eventually drove state and federal governments and UNESCO into an extremely positive partnership at a national and international level. And in saying this, I'm including the NGOs, the fishermen, the philanthropists, the activist organisations who ensured that both state and federal governments were committed to solving this problem. I think it's that landscape that's so important that it ensured Australia to live up to its obligations in terms of the demand that Australia put in place, a long-term plan with funding for preserving uh, this great marvel of nature, the Great Barrier Reef, from the threat of decline. And in this case, particularly focused on water quality. So over a three-year period, uh, successive meetings, uh, increasing publicity of the issue, state and federal governments evolved a response to the concerns of UNESCO that included restricting the port developments uh, to the five existing port, major ports along the Queensland coastline, as well as committing to significant steps to reduce the impact of coastal development on the Great Barrier Reef. Now, it was also agreed to implement the Reef 2050 Protection Plan, which bans the dumping at sea of dredge spoils, um, limits port development and focuses on cleaning up the water from disturbed catchments and coastal aqu aquaculture, uh, agriculture. And in response, UNESCO's World Heritage Committee decided not to add the Great Barrier Reef to the list of World Heritage Sites in Danger. And it was this decision, uh, and in its decision it welcomed Australia's plan to save the reef, and also demanded, though, that there would be progress reports, one at the end of 2017, and also one uh, on an update on the full uh, state of the reef uh, in terms of its conservation by December 2019. Now, perhaps astonishingly, given the antagonistic and counterproductive beginnings of this issue, the 21 countries on the World Heritage Committee enthusiastically embraced Australia's response to UNESCO's concerns, with many praising Australia for its handling of the situation, particularly by the CEO of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, Russell Reichelt, and the state and federal environment ministers, uh, the Honourable Stephen Miles and the Honourable Greg Hunt, who interestingly are from opposite ends of the uh, political spectrum, but working together did great things. So Australia avoided having its Great Barrier Reef being listed as a World Heritage property in danger, um, there is little doubt that this was a major victory for Australia and testimony that it had responded effectively to the soft power of UNESCO. But was it the right decision? On one hand, with 50% of the corals on the reef having disappeared over 30 years, uh, you wouldn't be criticised if you thought the Great Barrier Reef was in serious decline. On the other hand, you could conclude that the listing of the Great Barrier Reef as an a World Heritage Site in Danger, was premature for a couple of reasons. Uh, and this is a viewpoint I uh, have pretty much adopted and, and did so during this uh, debate. Uh, the first reason for not listing it as in danger, even though it's got clear signs of trouble, uh, is that the decline of the Great Barrier Reef began as much as 100 years ago, and hence it's not something that governments can turn around overnight. It's going to require a concerted, non-political process that recognises and aggressively tackles the problems of pollution, sediments and unsustainable fisheries. Um, given that we have not had an effective process for some time, water quality, for example, has been an issue for decades and didn't just pop up over the last couple of years, it would seem counterproductive to list the Great Barrier Reef as in danger at a time when federal and state governments have finally begun to take clear actions uh, in response to the issue. Um, 
It will also take time to rethink coastal agriculture, fix eroded gullies, and address issues such as coastal herbicide and pesticide use. Well, the second reason why uh, an endangered listing would have been counterproductive um, is that the response of these ecosystems does take a long time. And hopefully as coral populations rebound, seagrasses regrow, and threatened populations such as those of the dugong, a large marine mammal, recover, uh, we will need to make long-term observations before we really know what actions have been most effective. And so in this case, short-term international manoeuvring uh, won't save the Great Barrier Reef. We need to think beyond politics and recognise that safeguarding the reef requires a long-term commitment by Australia as a nation, not just a political process. Now, the third and last reason I would argue that um, listing would have been uh, inappropriate is the fact that it would be rather perverse for, um, for UNESCO to ignore Australia's clear intention to take the issue seriously. Given the effort that successive state and federal governments have made to avert an in-danger listing, what incentive would remain if the listing were made anyway? Uh, it would hardly help motivate future governments to fight the uphill battle, which would be an uphill battle, of getting such a listing removed again. From many, from many perspectives, Australia's response to the soft power intervention of UNESCO uh, has rebalanced the relationship between extractable and non-extractable resources and resource use in Queensland. And arguably, it has reduced the potential threat of rampant port development and mining uh, on the Great Barrier Reef region in general. And with its plan to revisit the situation on a regular basis, we have an outcome which will ensure that the issue doesn't fall off the front burner as it had in recent times. But again, is it a perfect plan? To some, the plan falls short when it comes to hard targets for water quality and other indicators of progress. Uh, without specific numeric targets, process of the plan will be difficult to assess. Others point to the fact that there are loopholes in the legislation drafted to limit the number of ports along the Queensland coastline. And others have concern that the plan doesn't specifically deal with climate change, which will interact and will make many of the um, goals difficult to achieve if we haven't solved that diabolical problem as well. So my perspective, and I'm looking forward to discussing this with everyone, is that this plan has been a... this whole process has been um, a great start and that the response of the Australian and Queensland governments to UNESCO uh, have been extremely significant. And although there's um, probably the need to invest more in solving the problems, and that's probably billions of dollars in the end, uh, this is really the first steps to, to taking this process. So what will be interesting to discuss today is how that process and all of the socioeconomics and science that's in, in involved in it, how that relates to achieving the SDG uh, goals, or the sustainable development goals. Um, in this case, you could see the Great Barrier Reef as almost a microcosm of the challenges that we face as we aspire to these 17 sustainable development goals. Each of these are interlocked with the others, creating almost the perfect Gordian knot, just like the Great Barrier Reef. And so I'm looking at those 17 here, and you can see the interactions that if you start to do work over here, you might actually have unintended consequences over here. And so this is going to be really the, the big challenge. Well, let me just now conclude. Um, UNESCO, uh, the, great, the, the UNESCO Great Barrier Reef uh, issue of the past couple of decades has highlighted the importance of thinking holistically when it comes to the balance between extractive use of resources by industry and the value of non-extractable uses in their own right. And at the heart of this is, one how, is how one balances the ongoing benefits of non-extracted resources versus the often short and very profitable benefits of extracted resources such as coal and gas. And tied to this, 
is uh, questions like, should we be considering uh, issues such as the impact or the ultimate impact of extracted resources uh, on places like the Great Barrier Reef through issues like climate change, recognising the fact that we are exporting many of the minerals that cause problems down the line for the Great Barrier Reef? Or is that an issue that needs to be dealt with in places like the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change? So in terms of seeding the discussion, uh, which is about to begin, I'd like to pose four questions uh, along with um, Salim. The first is, what conditions promote the sort of effective, soft international power and successful outcome that we've seen for Australia as part of the UNESCO World Heritage uh, process? Um, a second question might be, are there win-win options for extractives development and conservation and how does science and policy intersect with those options in this case? A third question might be around that question of the export of extractables such as coal and ultimate damage to the reef. And the last question would be, how effective was this UNESCO and World Heritage process in really pushing the conservation agenda? Well, thank you very much and we're now open for questions. Great. Uh, thank you so much, O, for encapsulating such a vast topic within 25 minutes. Uh, now, as you prepare to send us your questions through live stream or, if you like, through the email address that was provided, or if you would like to tweet your questions, you're certainly welcome to do that uh, by tagging uh, GCI Tweet, which is the Global Change Institute's Twitter handle, or my own Twitter handle, or OVES, uh, as well as uh, the Sustainable Minerals Institute, which is uh, Resource Rules is the Twitter handle there. Uh, to seed the discussion over, I'd ask you this uh, bluntly. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen the approval of uh, one of the world's largest coal mines just uh, at the doorstep of the reef, uh, which is going to be uh, established by Adani, a major Indian coal mining company. Uh, how do you see that approval playing out into this uh, decision, which you have described as a, a general success story of environmental conflict resolution? Mm. Well, I think it is a step backwards. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a consequence of, of decisions that were made um, many years ago and that are rolling forward into the politics of the day. Um, I think, uh, especially with the current mass bleaching and mortality event that's being driven by warmer sea temperatures, also highlights uh, how this may be a, a policy um, which is now outdated there might have been a phase in which large coal mines and so on. But with the diminishing price of coal now, uh, you really have to ask the question, uh, should we be building that sort of infrastructure or should we be headed to a more sustainable type of infrastructure, solar fields and so on? Now, as I understand it, uh, there is no taxpayers' money going into this, that mm -hmm. it is being developed by the international partners. Mm -hmm. um, but at some point, uh, we are going to have to phase out... Um, you know, things like coal mining. I mean, mm. um, one is only to look at the fact that we have to leave 80% of fossil mm -hmm. fuels that we know about in the ground mm -hmm. before we then exceed the two degree target, uh, which is seen as the difference between manageable and unmanageable climate mm. change, uh, to realise that, um, yes, it's probably not in the right direction at this point. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, I mean, I mm. suppose there are two ways to dissect this issue is one is the proximate impact of the mm. coal development and its transport. Mm. Um, and then the other is the broader climate change impact of the fossil fuels themselves. So on the first one, in terms of the mitigation plan that has been put forward by uh, the company and the state, mm. what is your view on that? And then we'll come to the climate change aspect. Well, it's all about which emissions we're talking about. If we're talking about the sort of sustainable footprint of, of the infrastructure mm -hmm. and not the product being shipped, yep. um, yeah, well, that's to be applauded. I think any, mm -hmm. any uh, effort to reduce the emissions of mm -hmm. things like the development of a large mine uh, mm -hmm. are really important. But when it comes to the commodity that's then shipped overseas and burnt, mm -hmm. I think we are in a dilemma because it is a very sizable contribution over the lifetime of the mine uh, to the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So mm. we really have to question whether this is uh, going to be good for humanity. Mm. Um, 
Now, you know, this could be part of that coal of that 20% that, that is burnt, but, I mean, all countries are going to view their mines as uh, being ahead of the others and part of the 20% that should be burned uh, in terms of, of uh, that last bit of emissions that we can safely, well, in fact, I would argue not safely, but mm. manage, manageably release into the atmosphere. Okay. So, look, this is a very, you know, I've, I've been involved in being an expert witness for some of these issues. Mm. Um, and when you do look at the scale of the mine that's been okayed, it does give you real concern in terms of its impact. And mm. what it tells, I think, the rest of the world. I mean, here we have a modern, wealthy, you know, privileged country uh, who has the, I think, the the, the buffer in its system and development and so on to go in a very different uh, direction mm. and to be a leader here. And given what we lose when it comes to, say, the Great Barrier Reef, uh, that should be more than enough to say, look, we don't want to, we need to leave this stuff in the mm. ground. Now, what about on the demand side? Uh, you know, a lot of the fossil fuels are going, of course, to the developing world, mm. and in this case, particularly to India, which is mm. one of the world's largest. Um, uh, developing countries, it, mm. in essence mm. it is, the world's largest democracy as well. Um, can we make the argument in terms of the sustainable development goals that India needs to achieve in terms of its infrastructure and energy delivery? Yep. Um, are there plausible alternatives which you think should be part of this mix if we were to have a global conversation on energy that is linked to issues like the conservation yep. of yep. the reef? Well, I think you know that um, there are various studies now that suggest that um, we should be leapfrogging. Mm. Um, uh, we have to provide energy to people as they develop. There's no question about that. That's mm -hmm. a major goal. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to repeat the mistakes of the past. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the opportunities and the studies that have been done saying we can actually leapfrog this, it just takes... It's not business as usual. And I think this is an important point. It does take a concerted and deliberate effort to go down that, that pathway. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the revolution in batteries that's going on across the planet, the revolution in you know, the making of, of electric vehicles, um, uh, the, the way we're generating power in large solar fields and so on, it starts, you start to question whether or not uh, we should be leapfrogging the provision of coal. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the arguments, I think, that has been made against the idea that coal is good for energy poor mm -hmm. is the fact that most of the people, or a large number of the people that are um, energy impoverished in India, aren't on a grid. Mm. So if they're not on a grid, then you know, providing coal-fired power isn't going to directly help them. On the other hand, remote power systems and storage uh, really are fit for purpose. Mm. And so I start to, uh, you know... And I think the last point I'll make, and this is mm. clearly controversial in Australia, unfortunately, mm. and that is that we need to price carbon properly. Mm. Um, we are ignoring the negative aspects of coal, which have very damaging effects on development. Mm -hmm. uh, you've only got to look at the mortality from, you know, um, smog and, and pollution, mm. uh, or look at the other unintended consequences of providing power that way to realise that we haven't priced it properly and we need to. Very good, mm. thank you. Uh, now we're getting some uh, questions uh, as well. Um, in terms of the, uh, the politicization uh, that's necessary to raise public awareness, uh, could you comment perhaps on uh, the World Heritage Committee's role in that regard? Uh, mm -hmm. It's an interesting question, mm -hmm. you know, whether you have to have politics, <laughs> right? <laughs> And I think, and it may be because this particular story had a happy ending, mm. <laughs> right? Um, that you saw a very positive outcome of a process that did become politicised. Now, mm. I suppose an ideal circumstance would be that it's a no-brainer uh, that we must not overdevelop the coastal regions, otherwise we'll you know, lose the Great Barrier Reef, and it was never going to be an issue, right? UNESCO wouldn't have mm. come to see us, yeah. or we wouldn't have had to invite them to come to see us. Um, but as we know, that doesn't happen in democracy. You are mm. going to have debates, and you are going to have... And I think what characterised this one was this, you know, that there was a free-for-all at one point, mm. and 
you know, facts and the truth were a casualty. Mm -hmm. But when it started to work around, uh, when it came back together again, mm. I think it was quite impressive. You had both sides of politics, plus science, plus managers and so on, working together to come up with a good solution. And that was a good positive dialogue with UNESCO. Mm. So I would venture that in a healthy democracy that the politicisation is inevitable and perhaps not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, given that it would be nicer to have no, that it was a done issue and that everyone, you know, but it's never going to be like it's that. You're going to have that sort of tension. Indeed. Now, one of the questions that um, has been coming up is around nuclear power. Mm -hmm. And you have written um, a very uh, supportive editorial mm -hmm. last year on nuclear power uh, along with uh, another colleague at, uh, at UQ. Uh, how does that play into this as in terms of, you know, Australia itself is a major uranium producer, but mm. people often criticize us for not having nuclear power domestically because of this mm. kind of a NIMBY approach that, yes, we want to sell mm. uranium, but we mm. don't want to have it here mm. uh, because of risk aversion, particularly mm. after Fukushima. Mm. Um, so, I mean, we're always trying for win-win outcomes, mm. but it seems as though we may run out of them, and the low-hanging fruit may well have been taken already. So yeah. would you comment on that, the mm. nexus with nuclear in this regard? Well, I think it's really important, my impression, I think this is mm. a w widely held opinion, that there's no silver bullet. Mm. Uh, it's not one or the other. It's actually a mix of solutions, mm -hmm. all the way from biomass to insulation to small-scale nuclear, mm. for example. And I think we've got to, again, and this is perhaps where politics isn't useful, mm -hmm. uh, is to stand back and take the advice of technologists and so on and, and start to, to map that out. Because mm -hmm. I think there's been uh, a damage to progress when it comes to uh, the fourth generation of nuclear generation. And some of these systems take the waste of, of past nuclear cycles. Yeah. And they reprocess it because actually 99% of the energy is still remaining in the waste material that we then have to store away for thousands of years. So mm -hmm. there's an opportunity there with um, sealed reactors that are small. That they might do several house, thousand households. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the advantage, of course, is that it's real a lot of power um, providing that important baseload that we have to replace. And as mm -hmm. people develop, we're going to have to provide. Yes, yes. So the energy density of uranium as a fuel source is a million times that of, you know, coal. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting and alluring from that point of view. Now, I'm also uh, cautious in terms of, of not wanting to be a techno-optimist and believe mm -hmm. that technology will ride over the hill with a perfect solution. Mm -hmm. I think there is a danger in that. Uh, and we've got to be careful not to rush into technologies where we create more problems, mm -hmm. again, as we look at all that those yeah. SDGs, more problems than we actually solve. Indeed. But, you know, you look at pebble-based reactors and you, mm. you, you think that... Um, and uh, this was a calculation I was told once um, from uh, Eric McFarland and others that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the US waste stockpile alone um, could um, power the world, everybody in the world, at a, a US use of power for a thousand years. Mm -hmm while getting rid of that waste substance. So there is some interesting thinking that could be done there. Mm -hmm. But I think caution, a range of solutions, no silver bullet. Yeah. Um, but then at the last point I'll make is that we need to treat this with a sense of urgency. Yeah. There are an enormous number of people now that are exposed as a result of climate change, which is developing really rapidly. We've only got to look at last month, February mm -hmm. being the hottest February ever. 1.35 degrees above, you know, the pre-industrial period. Mm. Uh, well off the curve when you look at um, temperatures in, in general. Mm. You've only got to look at that to realise that we have to turn things around, not under a business-as-usual scenario. It has to have real government frameworks and leadership mm. to take us away from the brink of this disastrous issue. Indeed, indeed. Um, now, we have another question here um, which states that on the 22nd of April, global leaders and heads of government will sign uh, the Paris Climate uh, Agreement. 
Uh, what are your thoughts on Australia's um, prospectus on that agreement uh, moving forward? And uh, any predictions or also <laughs> how, even if they do sign, uh, how can they actually operationalize it? Because we do have, this is another criticism of soft power institutions mm. is that people can sign and say, but often not deliver. And we mm. saw this some years ago with the uh, UN Convention on Desertification, which Canada had ratified, but uh, during the previous Canadian government, during the Harper government, um, Canada unilaterally withdrew from the convention, even though it had been ratified. Mm. And there was nothing that the world could do about it. Now, change in government means that may change in Canada, mm. but the same dynamic, how can we also, maybe to frame this question around how do we make accountability mm. around environmental diplomacy more salient? Well, you know, interestingly, this goes back to the politicisation, mm. um, the, the role of politics. Um, what happened in December last year at COP21 mm -hmm. uh, was extraordinary, mm -hmm. given um, how Copenhagen, at the previous sort of major meeting over targets, had, had not gone so well, right? Mm. And uh, in this case, I think getting everybody in the tent, over 190, I think it's 196 countries that came together and signed on to, essentially the target has been decided that we don't want to rise above 2 degrees Celsius, we want to keep well below 2 degrees Celsius, mm -hmm. and we want to drift to 1.5. Now, scientists have been unanimous on those targets for many, many years, and so it was really exciting to see that adopted mm. as core to that particular agreement. Mm -hmm. And so signing on to those uh, is a really interesting uh, prospect. And I should say that our Australian government, along with its state government, were very, uh, Queensland government, were very active uh, in that meeting. And I think mm -hmm. we could be proud of what they were doing. Mm -hmm. They were pushing very hard for these, these, this agreement that, mm -hmm. that we needed to have some very stick. Now, once you've signed on to that agreement, right, mm -hmm. you know, then that's when the hard stuff begins. Mm -hmm. And if we are to do that, that means we have to uh, decarbonise essentially over the next 30 years. Mm. Uh, that's not doing this with coal, it's doing that, mm, right? No. It's uh, a major change in what we do and it is literally on the scale or much more of a sort of a Marshall Plan for the planet. Mm. Uh, and that is not, again, a business as usual, let's tweak a few taxes and they hope it all, all works. Yeah. And so I'm, you know, I, I mean, I'm worried because we are dragging our feet, but I am actually very optimistic that we will see mm. Australia signing on and becoming a real actor on this stage. Now, it's really interesting mm -hmm. to consider the lay of the land when you look at the Greens, Labor and the LNP. Mm -hmm. They all have, you know, respectable uh, attempts at targets. Yeah. And what I think is going to happen next, and this is where politics again might become quite exciting, is that they might be competing mm. for how deeply they can cut emissions or, or take the, the direction to take the country in. Now, yeah. yes, again, I'm sounding like an optimist and so on and so mm. forth, but in a way I think we have to. Yeah. We have to take this on. We have to believe in it and get the job done because it is getting extremely worrying. I mean, having half of the Great Barrier Reef, the most pristine portions bleaching over the last month at a level mm. where we're going to lose perhaps 50% of corals, and that's yeah. probably conservative, is just scary. Mm. Mm. Indeed. Well, mm. And certainly on, in terms of Australian politics, I agree there's less polarisation on environmental issues compared to some of the other OECD countries, certainly mm. in the United States, my other country of citizenship, where, mm. where there is a much greater political difference between the parties on climate change. Um, now, the third question we have here is, uh, what are the lessons from this case for environmental extractive conflicts in other places? Can you draw some lessons in terms of how the mm. same process that Australia used both at the state and Commonwealth government level could be applied? Mm. And maybe I would um, frame this question around the role of science. As a scientist, how do you feel policymakers who are often quite detached from science, both in terms of the knowledge base as well as from uh, the, uh, the, the, the level of um, peer review and mm. understanding different kinds of scientific data. How can we use the lessons from this case and apply them elsewhere? Well, I, one thing 
I, th I, th I think this has changed again. It may be my optimism, but I think we're seeing a new type of politician evolving in this space mm. where um, science is becoming an important tool in which to allow things to be decided. Mm. So I think in the past you've had this sort of, you know, um, uh, thick wall between science and policy making. It's been very hard for science to penetrate and bring expert opinions to the table. Mm -hmm. And that has led to, I think, quite damaging politics where mm. really crazy decisions are being made or were being made. Mm. What, we're what we're starting to see, I think, are politicians that go, OK, um, we are going to assemble the right people around the table. We've got these advanced university systems in most countries now. Mm. Um, let's now pose a question to that community and let's get it out in the open, transparent, and mm -hmm. may have some not very convenient messages, but let's go with those, those decisions. Now, I'm not saying we've got perfect transformation of our political actors, but I think what we've got now is mm. that the science and the evidence is providing an object, a objectivity mm -hmm. to decision making where politicians can go, look, I don't really mind what that, well, I, I, won't be, I won't stand in the way of what science is telling me, but I need to know the answers and I need to then act on them. Mm -hmm. And I think we saw that at the end of this UNESCO listing saga, mm -hmm. was that suddenly there was a you know, science was coming in, they were now starting to look at the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority's outlook reports mm. and starting to realise, hey, this is not just, you know, greeny nonsense yeah. um, or environmentalist, you know, perspectives, I should say. I'm, I'm greeny myself, but, <laughs> um, but jo not just environmental perspectives. And so I think there's that evolution of, of, of a hard look at the science is actually a good political strategy. Mm. Okay, excellent. Now, in terms of, um, uh, just to wrap up the discussion, uh, with regard to the way in which uh, universities and grassroots organizations are playing a role through organizations such as the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, mm. um, you have worked with activists as well as with politicians and um, industry as well. Uh, w what is the best way to create that bottom-up momentum to reach these goals because mm. um, often we are told look um, you know this is something which has to happen organically mm. but it, if if you don't manage something well organically it can lead to anarchy mm. as well mm. uh, so any lessons in terms of how the political organization at the grassroots and especially for those of our colleagues who are part of the sustainable development solutions network um, that is quite a nascent mm. entity uh, what would be some suggestions uh, that you would have in that regard? Mm. Well, I suppose the SDGs, all 17 of them, are a series of really important road, road signs and rules for mm. operation. Mm. And so for me, networks are going to be really important in terms of using those road signs to bring together international coalitions mm. um, not just of the willing, but of the enabled. Yes. Um, because again, at the micro level, just thinking about Australia signing on to the Paris Convention, mm. that puts a very important stake in the ground about what we're going to do. It, it says we have to go down certain pathways, otherwise they're illogical. Mm -hmm. The same with the SDGs, to state them and then to have the various um, objectives underneath them and so on. Now, taking those and then making them empowered at an international level will require this ability to, mm -hmm. to, to find like-minded groups and to create those coalitions that will really have an impact. You've only got to look at things like um, sustainable fisheries. Mm. Um, that's going to be solved not by one country uh, or, or another dealing with their own resources. It's mm -hmm. going to be a global mm. push to, to take this really important issue on food security yeah. And, and, and oceans and fisheries and so on, and build that coalition that builds the sort of solutions such as, you know, eliminating, you know, unregistered illegal fishing that's looking at the benefits for people as opposed to large industrial organisations. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's what... It's a, for, it's, a, it's a great set of road signs and inscriptions mm 
Mm -hmm. that we can now take to build the, the sort of power we need. Now, as for whether this happens organically, mm. I think there's reason to believe that it's, it's the two things coming together. Yeah. That we have to have... They can't just be these goals out there and UN diplomats um, talk about them and that's the end of it. Mm. It's got to be about you, me, and mm. the person next door um, enacting the sorts of things we need to do to make them real mm. at the same time as all the medium layers like your network. Mm -hmm. So Indeed, it's yeah. an exciting time. I mean, Absolutely, I am an yeah. optimist, um, even though uh, we have had some challenges. Mm. I think the human experience is that we don't tend to <laughs> respond until the last moment, which is a little thrilling given what's on mm. the line. But we're going to get there. And we're going to get there not through business as usual, but with a decided effort to save the planet and its people. Indeed. Well, there you have it, friends. Um, we've had a very vibrant discussion using a particular case around extractive industries and conservation conflicts to try and solve many of the world's planetary problems. And we hope that this has just been enough to seed some ideas in your own networks and this will be part of a continuing series of webinars which we will have. We want to learn from your interests as well, so please feel free to contact us offline. We will have this webinar available for viewing and use in your classrooms and for broader uh, epistemic communities of knowledge, which is what SDSN really wants to be. So with that, uh, I thank you for your participation, and both Ove and I look forward to interacting with you in the future, whether in cyberspace or in person. All the best. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Professor.